It's July, and this is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals. And JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Jamie Sadokataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable, and we've got a stellar one lined up here for you. These monthly broadcasts, of course, lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our executive networking event, the Telecom Exchange, or TEX, you know, acronyms, we love them. And new for 2019, TEX is quarterly. Next one up, we're in Toronto, October 3rd, and then back to LA for our third Telecom Exchange there, November 11th through 12th. More at thetelecomexchange.com. But I think Mr. Philip Marangella might be speaking in Toronto, so definitely come and uh, and uh, show up for, for more Philip love. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Today's topic, pushing 5G to the edge, the realities, the concerns, and the real life use cases. We have an all-star lineup from four absolutely innovative companies joining us today. And to help us introduce them and moderate our panel, please welcome back Jerry Christensen. He's the founder and CEO of our industry's leading market intelligence and technology insights firm, Mind Commerce. Jerry, floor is yours. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you for a great introduction. So yes, we've been focused on 5G and, and edge computing for quite some time now. And I'm very excited about this panel of experts and I've got some questions prepared, but also we're gonna keep this very open and free flowing. So we'll see what direction it goes. What I'd like to do first is ha have each one of them introduce themselves. So Jordan, let's start with you. Great, thank you very much, guys. So my name is Jordan Wired, I'm with DataBank. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with DataBank, uh, we are a next generation hybrid cloud and IT service management provider um, with a very vast portfolio of services, but mostly with a focus on delivering, processing, uptime and integrity to the edge markets, um, as well as security and compliance around FedRAMP, FISMA, and some of the other things that you need in order to be able to uh, guarantee the integrity of that. So really excited about being on this and uh, thank you for your time. So who would like to go next, Philip? Sure, um, Philip Marangella here. Um, I'm the uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Edge Connects. Um, we also build data centers. Um, we kind of are a bit unique in the sense that we span the spectrum from building out hyper-local um, uh, facilities that uh, we call 220 edge pops uh, within buildings all the way to hyperscale data center facilities uh, for you know, large cloud and web hyperscalers, and then everything in between. So we have about uh, 40 plus data centers across 30 markets um, around the world. Um, and again, focused on service providers, network, content, cloud. Um, and we've been doing this for a number of years, building out at the edge. So we kind of have a unique perspective of, of a lot of those use cases and requirements that, that the service providers are building out uh, for their customers to enable uh, the opportunity for them to grow. Thank you, Philip. Rob? Hi, yes, good morning. Uh, so I'm Robert DeLeo, the CEO of Highland. Uh, primarily Highland's around for almost 60 years, uh, coming up next year. Uh, we're a full turnkey provider. We build um, fiber networks, uh, we build uh, cable networks, we build small cell networks. Uh, we do a lot of infrastructure building for smart city infrastructures. Uh, we do a lot of municipality work for communications and smart highways. Uh, currently, Highland, we're operating in about, um, oh, coming up on 12 states now. Um, some of the major cities, uh, New York City, Chicago, um, LA, Phoenix. Um, we're working in DC, Virginia. Um, we're doing some data center work, uh, obviously, in those markets today. Um, um, currently, um, also we do a lot of, uh, uh, I think I mentioned, uh, smart city infrastructure work as far as PS building, uh, we do bus shelters, uh, that have, uh, smart, um, digital displays that are attached to them. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Torin? Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Tormod Larsen. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Xnet Systems. Uh, Xnet Systems is the largest independent provider of what we call distributed networks. Uh, distributed networks in this context is small cell networks, distributed antenna systems, um, a lot of the 
um, CRAN, CloudRAN type uh, deployments. So when you talk about kind of 5G and the edge, we're really at the edge of 5G. We are building out a lot of the radio access networks um, for the carriers, out of that being uh, outside um, or in uh, buildings. Uh, so we are attaching to a lot of the infrastructure that uh, Rob mentioned in terms of street lamps, um, utility poles and so forth, but also bringing it back to locations that maybe in the past have been a hub and could potentially be, you know, distributed or edge data centers as well. So all of these things are start kind of coming together in, in a, the infrastructure that we're building, owning and operating. Thank you, Torin. So to kick things off, I'd like to make a few comments that are not going to be news to the experts here as part of this virtual roundtable, but I think will be a helpful backdrop, especially to those listening in or watching this video. So it's hard to talk about 5G and Edge separately. We will talk about them separately to a certain extent, but they're very intertwined, whether that be with respect to the radio access network or the core network. And one of the things I think it's important to keep in mind as we look at rolling out 5G is there's really three different unique classes of service. There is the enhanced mobile broadband, there is the massive machine type communications, there's the ultra reliable low latency communications, and each one of them have their own unique requirements. Some of them are overlapping and some of them are at times mutually exclusive. Some of those have to do with capacity, coverage, latency, and reliability. So I'd like each of you to kind of keep that as a a backdrop in mind as you answer the questions. And Rob, I'd like to direct the first question to you. So as we look at the build out of 5G, and part of that, of course, is the evolution of the long-term evolution standard LTE for 4G. And in particular, as we focus on smart cities, we all know that there's gonna be a massive build out, especially on the radio access network part of it, the RAN part of it. So provide some of your commentary there about how you see that evolving in general, and also if there's any specific examples that you can provide as to how well that's going and potential challenges that, that might be in store for not only a carrier as they roll it out, but also a municipality as they implement it and manage it. Yeah, so so you know we, we're building in a lot of these major cities where um, we're doing small cell attachments, to utility poles, street light poles, um, traffic signal poles, where some of the municipalities have opened up their infrastructure already. Um, you know, I'll give you an example about uh, New York is in their infrastructure about uh, 12 years ago for us for attachments on, on city street light poles. Um, you know, the problem we're seeing is, is they're only allowing, our, you know, carriers or um, uh, other companies that are you know, providing bills for, for carriers with a small amount of attachments per year. Um, so, you know, we're, we're you know, they get uh, two to 300 attachments allowed per year where they need thousands of attachments per year. So, um, you know, that's where we're seeing struggles. We're not seeing, um, you know, the municipalities um, opening their doors up enough for, for permitting for us. Um, these these challenges are, um, you know, we, um, there's a lot of fiber needed to, to small cell attachments, right? So we have to deploy a, a, you know, a large, large count of fibers um, to these, uh, these attachments. Uh, the infrastructure is there in some of the, the major cities. Um, when we get to the rural, the rural areas, there's so much of that infrastructure is not there. So it's going to be, you know, expensive builds for these for these guys to get out um, um, to to build, um, you know, a lot of these uh, attachments for 5G for, for small cells. Great, thank you, Herman. Would you like to weigh in on that as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, we're faced with it and it's interesting, you know, in, in a number of the uh, more dense metropolitan areas, to some extent we're running out of infrastructure, right? It's um, the number of viable locations are uh, dwindling down as, you know, we've been building out already 4G. Um, I tell people in our densest network in San Francisco, we already at 130 nodes per square mile. Um, so you, if you start thinking about that in, in some of these municipalities where, you know, it's uh, limited amount of, of infrastructure, uh, that's a challenge. Um, the other part of it for 5G specifically, as we've been deploying, you know, 28 gig and 39 gig, we have other limitations of where we could put the equipment on the poles. Um, we really have to kind of be 
on top of the pole with not only the antennas, but actually the Radiohead electronics itself as well. Um, and also because uh, of uh, the way it's kind of being built out right now, um, some of that is actually pretty big um, equipment. So it's, you know, it calls small cells, but from a physical perspective, it, it could be pretty sizable specifically as we try to build for multiple um, operators. Um, so that's obviously introduced some, some challenges, both from a aesthetics and, and loading perspective, but maybe even more importantly, from a power perspective. Um, these power 5G radios actually consume a lot of um, power, and that's not always available on the locations that we are, are doing. So um, but I think what Rob mentioned, you know, just the share volume is most probably the biggest issue for the municipality to really kind of come up with a process that accommodating you know, a program rather than a site by site. Great. So that's some good discussion on some of the RAN issues. I'd like to transition a little bit over to some of the core issues. And, and when I think of edge, edge computing, mobile edge computing, multi-access computing, I think of that as being part of the core. You guys might have some other ideas about that. I'd like to direct a question to Philip in that regard. So we've been talking a little bit about 5G and some of the issues, the availability of power and fiber and, and, and perhaps there, there could be some backhaul there for 5G to help with some of those fiber issues. But when we speak about the edge, one of the things that we often talk about is a multi-cloud environment, the prospect of the carriers deploying the edge and the prospect of there being some distributed data centers regardless of, of where they're located, perhaps uh, in an enterprise, uh, a telco closet that a large corporation has. So Philip, I'd, I'd love to hear some of your views on that, how you see this evolving and you know what you see is the carrier involvement and do we anticipate this over the top model the ott model perpetuating as it has with uh, some of the the apps that we currently have in, in an edge environment with edge specific apps I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that yeah yeah sure so look i think you know not just for cloud but what we're talking about here and, and what's interesting with the panel that that, that that's um brought together today is collectively what we're really trying to do is help re-architect the internet, right? And why is that? It's because the internet has been traditionally download central, right? And and the way it's been configured um, historically has been good enough to support this core out to the edge distribution notion, right? But if you look at whether it be cloud, whether it be you know over the top content, um, but then you see all these other things um, trends emerging in terms of virtual reality, cloud gaming, autonomous vehicles, so much data is being created at the edge and being sent back to the core, right? And so it, it's just not efficiently constructed. And so this is what, whether it's a data center, whether it's the network, wireline or wireless, whether it's the towers and all this stuff, we're working together to try to help um, satisfy the demand trends that are coming in terms of the volume of the data and the the velocity requirements the latency requirements that that data will require and smartly route that traffic so that it can alleviate those bottlenecks that are happening at the edge right and i think you know you know building out these data centers at the edge where you can do a lot more compute there rather than sending it all the way back to the core will be key to that right and smartly determining what what you keep at the edge what goes to other edges or back to the core is kind of what we're all working to help facilitate and, and alleviate these incoming, these upcoming bottlenecks that we're seeing. So I'll leave it at there. I'm sure Jordan also has uh, has seen a lot of this and has has thoughts on it as well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I was gonna turn it over to Jordan as well. I'd love to hear your perspective. You know, it's, it's interesting and Philip really hit the nail right on the head. If you look at the uh, edge computing market, it's looking to exceed $11 billion by 2024, with a CAG of about 35%. Um, it's not going anywhere, but it's being driven by a significantly large and collective amount of different attributes and different types of technologies to like re-architect the way that the internet works. Um, you know, you had mentioned something about cloud on ramps, right? And for us, edge computing at a data bank level is really within proximity to the processing and where the data needs to be. And then once that data is captured, 
how do we actually manage and guarantee the uptick or the integrity of that? Um, and part of that is being able to provide the aggregation to different types of multi-cloud multi and IT service management frameworks, right? Because um, as we continue to push out and more processing and more types of innovation and applications and all these different things, it's not one fits all. Um, especially, you know, if you look at Xtenet, um, part of the digital bridge uh, uh, family that Data Bank is a part of, you know, we are strategically working to be able to connect while being able to address the one to many type of requirements that are needed in order to be able to deliver this right. Um, so from our perspective, um, the over the top, a lot of the network function virtualizations, SD-WAN, a lot of these other different types of transformational technologies, um, we embrace those and we work in co-op with them to uh, really be able to condition it and provide those different paths and routes in order to get to what the uh, desired outcome is from the consumer. Great, thank you, Jordan. So piggybacking on that, Jordan, another question back to you, and then I'd like to have some others weigh in on it as well, is data. You talked a lot about data and, and so did Philip as well, the need to have edge computing, because otherwise you've got a backhaul back to the centralized core cloud computing infrastructure, which obviously induces delay. And so that's gonna be a big problem for some of these ultra reliable low latency applications like virtual, uh, and any kind of virtualized service like uh, uh, augmented reality or uh, autonomous vehicles. Now, the big question is about data, who owns it? That's a big rhetorical question. Uh, who has the care of custody, especially if, uh, if it's an OTT model where maybe it's a third party that's actually managing the app on the edge computing infrastructure. So what are your, some of your thoughts around that, Jordan? How, how is the whole data ownership and, and uh, custody issue gonna evolve? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, when we're looking at data, we are still limited in one universal thing, and that's the speed of light. Until we figure out how to leverage black holes and start jumping around in different universes, this is the one common thing that we all have to kind of address, right? Um, with that being said, we look at it as in a partnership with all sorts of other providers, right? Data bank doesn't own the data, right? Um, we own and have the responsibility for supporting that data and aggregating that data with other types of strategic partners and, and, and stuff like that. So ultimately what I would say is it's collectively owned, um, but the ownership is really more scoped through a guarantee or a service level agreement, right? And being able to say, we guarantee this type of performance for this type of environment or this type of guarantee for this type of objective or outcome that the business or the consumer wants. Um, but ultimately, that data goes across a lot of different providers, again, especially with the OTTs and all the new types of platforms. Um, we're all just working together to make a really nice meal. Great. Thank you, Jordan. So, Philip, just, I'd like to go back to you on this one as well. And I'm, I'm going to amend the question just a little bit because I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on what I'm trying to get at with this. So there's a lot of data that's going to be created by 5G and edge computing, an autonomous vehicle, for example. So who owns that data and who has the right to do stuff with it for lack of better words and so you know is it the automobile manufacturer if they're providing transportation as a service is it the carrier is it maybe a third party is it the end user is it all the above and how do you see that data being used whether it's real-time data do you see it being syndicated uh i'd like i'd love to hear your thoughts on that yeah i mean as a data center operator you know it's it's up to our customers in terms of how they want to use the data and how they want to share it. But I think what's more important when you think about these use cases and what people are doing is that, um, you know, what's important is this edge peering notion and the, in, in terms of the transfer of the data and how you more efficiently and effectively um, distribute that data between the kind of supply chain of, of the creators and consumers of that data. And then, you know, those ecosystems that evolve, right? The, an autonomous vehicle, it's not just Ford, but it's also, you know, it's like Bosch that has a lot of systems on it. It's, it's um, you know, Bridgestone, it's the municipality. They all want access to it and to leverage it to be smarter about um, how they, you know, how so the car can become more autonomous, autonomous in and of itself how the streets can be more efficient in terms of traffic flows and this, that, and the other. And what we're trying to do is just build that platform where you can interact with the different ecosystems across, whether it's autonomous vehicles, whether it's cloud gaming, right? 
um, and, and allow people to transfer that data, right? Just think about the airports that, you know, it can't just be United Airlines only has access to Dulles. You want to be able to switch from one airline to another within that same, you know, that's why you have the different terminals and gates and so forth. And that's what we're trying to enable because when I talk about this re-architecting the internet, that has to scale out at the edge and make it easy for folks to interact. And what's important is that the networks don't say, hey, this is my 5G, I've built this out, I've paid all this money, and I'm only at letting you ride on my network because a, a provider or a uh, service provider like a Google or you know Facebook or what have you will want access to all those networks. And so we're just tr trying to provide a platform for them to interconnect seamlessly and, and efficiently. Great, thank you, Philip. So we've talked some about infrastructure, we've talked about edge and data. I'd like to turn things back over to Rob and to Torman. I'll start with Torman first. Uh, the open-ended rhetorical question is, what are some of the leading 5G edge-supported applications going to be? And uh, you could pick any segment you want. If you want to look at the consumer segment or enterprise, industrial, or, or government, what do you see as some of the, the leading applications? You could pick any one of them. And um, when you answer the question, Torman, let us know some of the challenges in, in supporting it, whether it be reliability, capacity coverage, or latency. I'd, I'd like to hear some of your views on that, Torman. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe to pivot back to a little bit what you asked about in terms of data. Um, one of the things we are seeing right now, which is kind of related to 5G, is this notion of private networks, right? And you talk about being at the edge. Those are really at the edge. And you talk about having the need for edge compute. You know, and in these cases, it's actually maybe a little bit opposite of what Philip said. It is actually application. If you are in manufacturing, you don't want Google and Facebook and all of those have access to that data. Or you're in, in healthcare, right? Same thing. So now you have specific applications. Either that is based on you know, a lot of, of data. So the broadband aspect of what you mentioned earlier, or you know, massive IoT type applications that are specific to that locality or that, um, um, you know, uh, hospital if you want, or you also have mission critical applications like in manufacturing where they don't want to be interfered with. So for example, we had a customer just uh, this week that had 20,000, you know, cyber attacks on their network. You know, you don't want to be in the, those cases maybe connected to the to the internet, right? So those are just some applications that we're seeing. And now it's like, okay, how do you tie that then maybe to, if you are in those those facilities, you also want kind of the public layer of functionality. You want actually the internet, but here's the application that you want to segregate. So those are, you know, I don't know what, what, what the, Answer you are looking for, but we see that as as a pretty interesting, um, you know, evolution not only for 5G but in, in general in the in the wireless industry. And um, even with 5G and kind of combining it a little bit, what we're doing on the RAN side, where you ending up with this concept of networks within networks. So, for example, in a stadium where we are deploying, you know, 5G today, you not need 5G outside because it's in the stadium that. You know, you have some of these applications that really are driving the need for higher bandwidth and, you know, like I said, augmented or virtual reality type applications, but they're not applicable when you walk to the restaurant across the street um, because that's not where they have the right or want to provide them because they want to bring people into the stadium. So hopefully I gave you a little bit of a, a flavor of some of the stuff we're seeing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'd like to actually drill down into that a little bit more and, and give some others a chance to weigh in as well. You bring up some great topics, uh, the notion that there's going to be public networks and there's going to be private networks. It also fits in with the multi-cloud environment thing that we talked about earlier. And so, uh, and Rob, you, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this as well. From an infrastructure perspective, how do we support this in a way so that if there's a wireless network, and as Torman was saying, they have different types of privacy and security requirements than say a public network, how do we build out the infrastructure in a way to support this multi-cloud environment to ensure security and privacy in both contexts, one being the public cloud per se, and the other one being the, the private cloud that you might see in an industrial application, for example. 
Yeah, so so we see most of our our clients today are building their networks, their 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 own fiber networks back to their own facilities or and or to the to the carriers' facilities. Um, you know, so 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 they'll own those networks. Um, generally, when we're building networks for the cities or or municipalities or um, government agencies, um, they're not going to share their networks with, with with any other carriers just from a from a from a security standpoint. Um, we, we do see um, streetlight uh, infrastructure and utility poles where um, they will allow, uh, you know, there'll be multiple fiber networks on, the, on those poles. Um, again, they should be uh, separated so that um, there's, there's, no, there's no risk of security where, uh, where, where, where they're crossing. Um, as far as applications, you know, we're, we're seeing all different types of applications where we're deploying these networks too. So, as Torman mentioned, stadiums, um, we're, we're deploying them out to subway stations. We're, you know, we're deploying them out to, to bus shelters where, where we can put uh, these networks on, on, a, on what we call a smart bus shelter. Um, we see kiosks going in, in replaces of uh, old phone booths. Um, so we'll, we'll see networks being built to, um, to, those, to those new, new kiosks. All of these can be uh, you, you know, used for 5G applications. Okay, fantastic. Jordan, I'd like to go back to you. Consumer versus business 5G apps, which one and why? What's going to be the big ROI? It's consumer versus business. You know, I think the ROI is going to be, at least from an infrastructure perspective, the amount of data and the amount of uh, consumption and infrastructure that's required in order to support it. I wouldn't say it's necessarily one or the other. Um, I think it's maybe a little too early for that and time will tell. Um, but our interest kind of going back again from the four walls and the roof, private versus public, all these different types of aspects, um, you know, we just want to provide whatever those guarantees are for that. Um, and the more data and the more consumption equals more density. Um, Edge obviously allows to thin out a lot of that data, which drives a high ROI and a high uh, uh, yield from a financial savings perspective. Um, but ultimately, I think time will tell. And it's a little too early right now for that. Great. Philip, what do you think? And also answer within the context of the, the private networks. Like what do you what kind of killer apps do you see on private networks and how do you see that comparing to the broader consumer perspective on 5G? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, you know, from a 5G perspective, you know, 4G for a lot of the applications and workloads that we see today is still good enough, right? For, and and um, but you know, we still have to prepare and build out 5G, right? Uh, for the future, the the kind of tidal wave of of data that's coming. In terms of those use cases, again, private or public. You know, you see smart cities, you see smart homes, you see industrial IoT and consumer IoT. Um, you know, like Jordan said, it's um, that the wave is starting to swell, but you know, it's too early necessarily to to determine. I think I, I'd probably lean more on the the enterprises and some of the things that they're trying to build out, and those you know, kind of volume of of requirements are gonna kind of be a leading indicator. Um, but it doesn't matter to us, right? We're just a platform to help enable, whether it's consumer, whether it's government, whether it's enterprise, um, to kind of support that and work with the networks, the clouds, the content guys to all try to figure this out seamlessly. All right, fantastic. So as we wind down here, one final question I'd like each of you to, to provide an answer to, if you can, perhaps somewhat briefly, and that would be 5G, when's it gonna be here? You know, we're all seeing on, LinkedIn and the media, these pictures of these great one gig downloads. Uh, and of course that's focusing on the radio access network, but uh, what about the core? What about the, the whole latency? And, and one of the reasons why we're having this discussion is, you know, there's 5G and edge because you need to keep that latency low. So Torman, when's 5G gonna get here? I know it's somewhat of a rhetorical question, so you can answer it from whatever perspective you want. When are we gonna have it? No, it's a, it, it, a good, good question, obviously. From an infrastructure perspective on the RAND side, we're already building 5G networks right now for our customers. Um, and obviously some of the carriers already launched the service. I think maybe the, the bigger question in the context here is, you know, when do we really start seeing a difference from a consumer perspective or a business perspective? That's how, how does it really start transforming, you know, businesses and really have the impact uh, that you mentioned uh, earlier? 
I think if you look at kind of a little bit of history, we are several years away from that. Two, three years before we start seeing some real applications that are more than kind of a next step from 4G. Uh, but again, you need a, the, the basis and that's what we're building as we speak. Rob? Yeah, I agree with uh, with Torman. You know, I you know I, I will put it in two parts. I think uh, our major cities will, will see the infrastructure built a little faster. Um, I think the rural areas will be uh, a little bit more of a challenge, as it will be pretty expensive uh, to build out those markets. Um, but I but I agree, we're we're still several years away. Philip? Yep, I I agree. Um, I think the, the networks in particular are still. Um, going to make use of their large investment in 4G and try to maximize that for as much and as long as they can. So 5G, I think, you know, you're going to see trials and proof of concepts and so forth, but in earnest, it won't be to the mid-20s where you, where you start to see 5G really take, take hold across many markets across the country. Jordan? It's not if it's when. So from an infrastructure provider, uh, we're ready for it. We've been ready for it. We've got the backing. We've got the capabilities within the four walls on the roof. We've got the connectivity, um, all the different on-ramps, the management, the security. Really, it's uh, it's just as it continues to organically uh, uh, progress, right? But uh, from the data center operator side, we're, uh, we're hoping it's going to be sooner than later, but uh, time will tell. Great answers. I really appreciate that. And one of my, I'll add my personal view on that one. I really think that fixed wireless is going to be very important for 5G for the foreseeable future and that there's going to be some challenges with mobility, not only with the obvious things like rolling out the smart antennas and things like beam forming, but also with handover. Torman brought up a great example of uh, an in-venue app, you know, maybe in a stadium where it makes sense to have your edge compute there and your 5G coverage there. But what about when somebody attempts to walk out of the stadium and they need to hand over to LTE and maybe the edge compute is not even available there. So. You know, there's going to be all kinds of interesting issues that are going to come up. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate your views. You're great experts, and this has been a really good panel. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Jerry. Uh, your insights always uh, amazing. And, and I have to say, this entire panel, um, your views on pushing 5G to the edge, uh, really uh, appreciate uh, this all-star panelist. Um, again, Rob DeLeo, Hyland, Philip Marangella, Edge Connects. Jordan Wired, Data Bank, Tormid Larson, Extinet Systems, and of course, Jerry Christensen, founder of Mind Commerce. And viewers, thank you for tuning in. And if you liked today's content, come hear us at live to our CEO roundtables at Telecom Exchange again quarterly. Next one up, Toronto, October 3rd, with just a few speaker seats and sponsorships remaining. So go ahead and check out more at the telecomexchange.com. And to feature your thought leader here next time on our monthly virtual CEO roundtables, email us pr at jsa.net. That's it for this Friday. Thanks for tuning in to JSA TV. And until next time, happy networking.